Welcome to today's webinar, Preparing Critical Infrastructure for Climate Change, Water Utilities Leading the Way, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning. My name is Jason Dubo, Manager of the Resource Conservation and Management Unit with the Maryland Department of Planning. Critical infrastructure, such as highways, power grids, and water utilities, are threatened by extreme events associated with climate change, including hurricanes, flooding, drought, and heat waves. Planners, emergency management offices, and public works departments are increasingly concerned that our critical infrastructure is not properly sited or designed to withstand climate change. Today, Jacobs Engineering Incorporated will discuss the recently completed five-year climate change vulnerability assessment adaptation and mitigation plan project, the CCVAAMP for WSSC Water, one of the largest water and wastewater utilities in the nation. Also, Baltimore County, Maryland, will discuss its Climate Action Plan and Resilience Assessment and Storm Drainage Asset Management Program. With service to more than 2.5 million customers, WSSC Water and Baltimore County are leading the way to protecting our critical water infrastructure. Also, the webinar is part of our department's effort to promote the new water resources element guidance to local planners. A link will be provided in the chat. This webinar is one of many webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning. The department also produces webinars on behalf of the Smart Growth Network on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives planning tools and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website. We encourage you to visit the website and to visit smartgrowth.org where you can subscribe to our email list to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Preparing Critical Infrastructure for Climate Change, Water Utilities Leading the Way. You can also search for event number 9259333 Our speakers today are Lawrence Vandertak, Miranda Santucci, and Radu Zimferaki. Lawrence is Jacobs Engineering's Water Resilience Director for the Americas. He is a water resources engineer with 34 years of experience addressing stormwater and water resource issues. He is past chair of the American Water Works Association's Water Resources Sustainability Division and of the AWWA Climate Change Committee. He has degrees from Cornell University, UC Davis, and MIT. Miranda is an engineer and project manager in Jacobs Silver Spring, Maryland office. She has more than 11 years of experience managing and delivering water resources and water wastewater engineering and planning work including utility resilience planning studies. Radu is a senior, en senior engineer with the Baltimore County Department of Public and Transportation, Public Works and Transportation, where he started his US public service career two decades ago in the storm drainage section design. Previously, Radu worked as a site development engineer for 12 years, four in the US and the rest in his native Romania, where he earned his environmental engineering degree specializing in land reclamation and his master's in the physics of porous media. Purdue's career highlights include the development of the framework and numerous provisions of Baltimore County's Climate Action Plan, Baltimore County's Drainage Asset Management Program, significant contributions to Baltimore County's Design Manual, Baltimore County's TMDL Implementation Framework, and several seminal presentations and talks concerning the mechanisms for building up resiliency and versatility in the county's infrastructure. Radu holds a professional engineering registration in the state of Maryland and several surrounding jurisdictions. 
Following their presentation, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. We will take two quick polls to get started. If you are unable to respond to the poll by clicking, please leave full screen mode. So our first poll is, where do you live or work? So please select one and we'll take a few moments for you to respond. And those options again are Maryland, Mid-Atlantic outside of Maryland, U.S. outside of Mid-Atlantic and outside of the U.S. All right, I think it's enough time. Let's see the results here. We have in Maryland, 19%, the Mid-Atlantic outside of Maryland, 22%. U.S. outside of the Mid-Atlantic, 47%, and outside of the U.S., 12%. So great variety today, that's great. And our second poll, have you taken actions to address the impacts of climate change? Uh, please select one we have as options, no specific actions taken yet. Um, yes, we've appraised our potential vulnerabilities. Yes, we've developed an adaptation plan and guidelines. And yes, we've incorporated into our design and operations. So just take a few moments and please respond as will help us in our presentation and for interest for everybody. Thank you. All right, let's see here. We have about 45 seconds here and Yes, so the results are that 40% of you have not taken specific actions yet. 22% um, have appraised potential vulnerabilities. A quarter of you have developed an adaptation plan already. And 14% have incorporated strategies into your design and operations, strategies and projects. Thanks very much. Um, that's helpful for our, pres our presenters as well. Very interesting, thank you. Okay. So next, with that, I'll turn it over to Malcolm Taylor with WSSC Water, who will introduce the presentation by Jen Jacobs Engineering. Welcome, Malcolm. Thanks, Jason. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Taylor. I'm an environmental engineer with WSSC. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce you guys to our uh, climate resilience and mitigation plan. We partnered with Jacobs Engineering. So we, we here in the utility industry, we, we don't have the luxury of debating who's at fault or whose reason it is that climate change uh, is occurring. Uh, we have to be prepared to adapt and be resilient in the face of the climate that is, is changing. Um, this is no longer an existential threat that we've talked about and debate the causes of. Uh, we're seeing extreme weather events, uh, flood prone assets, um, these infrastructure required to combat these are expensive. They're very long-term projects. And so uh, we as a commission um, developed this plan to uh, partner with Jacobs to start to lay out a, a framework of how we would go about um, assessing our vulnerabilities and what we might do about it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so um, I'll give you a brief introduction of who we we are, WSSC Water. We'll provide an interview, uh, as, I'm sorry, an overview of the, the plan that we worked on with Jacobs, including climate analysis and projections. We'll talk a little bit about facility vulnerability assessment and, and the adaptation planning. And again, a lot of this is something that you really need to get ahead of because yes, it's easy enough to suggest this generator is in a floodplain, but moving that generator or assessing the risk of flooding and the cost versus the benefit is a very difficult thing. It's very time consuming. And so uh, in our instance, we, we really felt like it was con in, uh, <clears throat> incumbent upon us to get ahead of, of that. And at the end, uh, as Jason mentioned, we'll take some questions. So with that, I'll give you a brief background 
uh, as to who we are. WSSC Water, we serve uh, Montgomery County and Prince George's County, the two counties that surround Washington, D.C. So we serve a population of almost 2 million people. We have five water re resource recovery facilities and two water drinking water plants. A significant portion of our service area is discharged to uh, the Blue Plains facility within the District of Columbia. So we are effectively in partnership uh, with DC Water, which is the city proper. Here in the DC metro region, uh, we are surrounded by critical waterway. We're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We have extremely stringent nutrient limits. Uh, the vast majority of our collection system is within 50 feet or less of sea level. Uh, we're within floodplains. We've got a lot of tributaries and streams to the Chesapeake Bay. And as I said, we have extremely tight limits on nutrients, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And so uh, we're, we're fortunate to not be in, in Hurricane Alley and be uh, currently ongoing a drought as many people are in the West at this time, uh, but we must be prepared for these given that we are again, a, a very large metro area outside the capital of the nation. Uh, it's absolutely contingent upon us to be prepared for these severe weathers and be resilient in the manner in which we provide this essential service to this critical um, part of the nation and very densely populated. And so again, as I said before, uh, we partnered with Jacobs to take a comprehensive look at where we are and where we need to go in order to reach our goals of, of being resilient and less vulnerable to climate change. So with that, I will turn it over to Jacobs. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Malcolm, uh, and great to be with you all. Um, this is Lawrence Vandertack, and I'm going to do the first part of uh, the background on the CC VAMP project, as we like to refer to it, um, and then I'll be turning over to Miranda Santucci. So, over, overall view of what the CC VAMP uh, pr project um, is about is listed here. Um, essentially, we start out with doing uh, what we all call the overall climate adaptation framework, which includes developing climate scenarios and projections and developing uh, flood models of the, the different systems, um, as, as Malcolm was just describing, uh, surrounding the Washington, D.C., Prince George's County um, and Montgomery County area. Use that information to then drive a vulnerability assessment. Um, from there, we get into more detailed risk analysis and develop a, an adaptation framework. Um, in parallel, we also did a mitigation planning, greenhouse gas inventory and action plan, which we won't be talking about today. Um, and, uh, you know, once you've developed that overall um, plan, move into implementation, um, integrate this with the overall capital improvement plan that uh, addresses other goals and of course monitor and reassess because there's uncertainty in a lot of the projections so you need to be able to to regularly monitor and reassess uh, where you're going so next slide please and we can skip over this we're going to start out by the climate analysis and projections um, so the interesting thing a lot of folks don't realize about the Washington DC area is there's parts of it um, that is tidal. So we had to look at impacts from both extreme rainfall, extreme storms, as well as sea level rise and storm surge. And part of developing climate scenarios um, to assess the risks to, to WSSC's facilities is understanding the different types of events and develop climate scenarios for our modeling that supports those. There's both stormwater and drainage type flooding, more typically associated with smaller two to 10 year storms. Um, they can cause localized flooding or increase SSOs. Then there's riverine flooding, uh, as the name implies, along the rivers and, and major um, stream valleys, uh, typically 100-year storms, regional flooding. And then, of course, there's the coastal issues with sea level rise and storm surge uh, that needs to be considered as well. And parts of the uh, WSSC water service area uh, is subject to um, all of those. They could all happen separately or at the same time. Next slide, please. So a key part of developing um, the scenarios for modeling and assessing risk is to uh, do climate projections. Um, a lot of the climate science, uh, we could spend a whole hour talking about this, so I, I'm not gonna belabor that. 
um, but we, we pulled from the latest, the latest global climate models to develop projections for each of those different return intervals. Um, this is just one example, the 100-year, 24-hour storm, and shows one of the greenhouse gas scenarios. So it gives you a sense of the, the types of change and risks that, uh, that might be occurring. So the current 100-year uh, storm is about 8.4 inches of rain in, in 24 hours. And that is projected to increase uh, by the time you get out to 2065 to 9.7. And you see there also the values for 2040 and 2100. But most of our focus was on the 2040 as well as 2065. 2040 being about 20 years out, um, roughly the service life of assets for electrical and mechanical systems. And then the 2065, you know, 70 plus years out from when we started this effort, um, sorry, 50 years out from when we started this effort, um, is more appropriate for structural systems if you're building a brand new building or underground conduits and so forth. So this gives you um, the, the rainfall projections. Next slide, please. So we also had to look, of course, at sea level rise and how that affects uh, concerns uh, also for uh, coastal and, and storm surge. So this shows um, the projections of at high tide um, in terms of actual uh, meet changes in the mean higher high water, MHHW. Um, the left-hand side of this shows the actuals, the, the dots in, in the black line is the trend through those. And then you can see uh, for one of the available projections, there are several different curves, but this is the one we selected uh, for this analysis shows again the projections for 2040, 2065, and 2100. So the net increase uh, we're looking at is, is, uh, is from about two, two feet of high tide up to about four feet. So almost a, a two foot rise in, um, by the time you get out to 2065 in that high tide. Uh, next slide, please. We also looked at temperature projections um, while we, didn't spend a lot of time focusing on this. There are concerns uh, of the, the, the ability of electrical mechanical systems, uh, SCADA panels and, and systems outdoors to long um, periods of, of intense heat. And so this graph just shows the, the, the number of days um, and how that's expected to change above 104 degrees Fahrenheit my uh, electrical system colleagues indicate that a lot of the um, typical electrical systems, electrical panels are, are designed to withstand heat up to about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's 40 degrees Celsius. Um, but when you get above that, uh, those systems uh, don't perform very well. So we, we sort of showed how, how long um, they might be exposed to that kind of temperature increase. Next slide, please. So the first step in doing this was to uh, do some modeling. And I'll, I'll just start out the discussion on the modeling and the vulnerability assessment and then turn it over to Miranda. Um, this is a little bit of a, a complicated map here on the left-hand side. But just to summarize, the, the geology of the Washington, D.C. area is marked by a fall line. You can sort of see that on, on the, the geologic map on the right. It passes just to the west of Washington, D.C. And, and those areas. When you are below that fall line to the right, it is coastal. You actually have tidal variations in downtown D.C. and some of the tributaries, the Anacostia and Piscataway Creek. Those dots on the map show the various WSSA facilities, uh, pump stations, uh, treatment plants, and the like. And to the left of that line is uh, more riverine systems that are rainfall-driven flooding. So we modeled those differently. On the left-hand side, we used uh, heck ras to do the riverine modeling, show how with future rainfall uh, water levels could increase for different design storms. And on the right, we used uh, Mike 21. Um, both of these models were, were calibrated based on available data. Uh, so the Mike 21 model allowed us to look at storm surge for historic um, hurricanes. And then we applied that with sea level rise using Mike 21 to see how the flood elevations would change with sea level rise. Uh, next slide. So the, the first step of the vulnerability assessment was to look at where facilities are, are currently located uh, in GIS. There's over 200 plus facilities that are uh, in or close to those floodplains because we had to look at areas that could end up being in the floodplain after ex the extreme events. 
Those 200 plus facilities were narrowed down to about 49. They were located in or near floodplains. And then we actually categorized those based on the ones that are most critical to WSSC's operations. Um, and we ended up with uh, 18 that we looked at at the end of the vulnerability assessment, 18 that we would carry forward um, into the detailed risk assessments. They're roughly half and half in the coastal areas versus riverine systems and quite a mix of, of actual wastewater pump stations, uh, treatment plants um, being a significant issue. Um, and then a, a few of the, the water systems, and most of those are up high, so the drinking water systems tended not to be as vulnerable. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Miranda to uh, walk you through how we did the risk assessments in the actual uh, adaptation uh, and strategy analysis. Great, thanks Lawrence. All right, hang on a second, oh, here we go, okay. So uh, one of the first parts of the conversation to, to move into the vulnerability assessment was to determine uh, a facility level of service for water and then wastewater facilities, since those were the two main facilities we're dealing with in these assessments. So on the wastewater side, we just looked at, um, in terms of criticality during wet weather conditions, what are the most um, critical to maintain a level of service? So on the wastewater side, that first tier is those um, assets needed to maintain the hydraulic capacity of the wastewater treatment plant, keep the um, water moving through the plant. Um, number two, primary treatment, um, liquid treatment process disinfection, three being um, secondary uh, liquid processes, and four being the solids treatment, because since typically there's a storage, um, there's some storage uh, capacity at a, at a given plant. Um, and then on the water side, we have three um, designations for level of service. So during that wet weather kind of extreme condition, prioritize, um, you know, finished water pumping uh, equipment, keeping the distribution network uh, running and, and understanding what's going out, going on in the distribution network and disinfection. Secondary, the, um, number two is liquid, liquid filtration treatment processes and three being solids, because again, there's typically a storage um, available for that. Um, so that level of service uh, was used to kind of, as we went into each of these facilities, understand on an asset by asset basis, um, which were uh, contributing to the first level of service, second level of service, third level of service, and so on, um, to help frame the discussion of um, criticality and priority uh, when it comes to um, adaptation for these assets. So this slide um, goes through our, our general approach. I'll spend a little bit of time here. For the risk assessment, we first looked at using the design flood elevation that was, that was computed using uh, the forward thinking future conditions modeling. So what we did was um, determine that flood elevation um, for a given facility based on the modeling output and based on the planning horizon. So if you look at the figure there, um, the blue uh, water column there is just giving um, an elevation of water surface, and on the right, on the sorry, on the left hand side, you can see a listing of the different flood elevations. So the blue is the 2065 design flood elevation, 2040 is in the the kind of maroon color, and then the current condition, so FEMA or 10 state standard condition, is in the pink there. Um, so just a comparison of where are falling depending on the output of those uh, modeling exercises. So we use those elevations um, to inform where the, um, you know, where the expected design flood elevation might be for those planning horizons. Then we identified all of the assets at risk below that elevation. Um, so you'll see the assets over there on the right hand side. Um, we determine the level of service for each of those assets. So are they contributing to maintaining hydraulic capacity or maintaining um, the finished water distribution on the water side? Um, third, we for the high level of service assets, so those that were one or level of service one or two, um, and they were located under that design flood elevation or at risk due to that, you know, in that flood elevation um, condition, we developed an asset level strategy. So we looked at how that particular item can be uh, protected uh, or, or um, hardened in some way. Um, for the buildings at risk, we also developed building level strategies. Finally, we calculated the benefit of those adaptations. So what um, risk avoided costs would, 
would WCC see from um, implementing an adaptation? And then we compared the benefits to the costs of, of those flood-proofing alternatives. So again, on this figure on the left are the elevations, and we were looking at that 2065, so that, that blue um, design flood elevation, flood elevation there. And then on the right are the assets, and of course, also very important is the vector through which those assets might be vulnerable. So if the assets were located um, in a lower level, perhaps the, the vector might have been through a door or a louver or so, some such. So understanding where those vectors are and how they impact the assets, of course, was important as well. Um, and that was done with a combination of, of looking at, at the as-built drawings for these facilities, you know, doing some site visits, going out and, and doing some survey if, if there were um, elevations that needed to be collected to really pin down where the assets and, and flooding vectors were. So I talked a little bit about the benefit and, and the way that we um, determined that was this cumulative risk avoided. So that is intended to account for um, the climate change impact over the expected life of each asset. So the graph here is showing the plotting of that annual risk. So the annual risk of, um, of damage to a particular asset or building facility um, each year. And you can see it's increasing due to that probability of the flooding event occurring. So the calculation there, you can see in the bold, the annual risk avoided is the probability of the flood event in a given year. So if it's a um, 100 year flood, that 1% annual chance um, flood, that is multiplied by the replacement cost of the asset um, that we were able to obtain by WSSC's um, Asset Management Division. And then that's multiplied um, by a factor to account for the failure potential of a given strategy. Some strategies are more reliable than others. So we wanted to make sure we were um, not assuming that they're all entirely fail proof. So that annual risk avoided um, constitutes the potential benefit of, um, or, or sorry, the cumulative risk avoided. So summed over the, the service life of, of that asset, that represents the benefit um, to the utility of protecting that particular asset. So we include the um, flood probability through um, 2040 in this case, because the service life of electrical mechanical assets is typically on that order of about 20 years. Um, we also account for the, the failure potential of the strategy, and um, we present that in um, annual risk in discounted dollars. For the adaptation strategies, this, this table here is just to give a little bit of flavor of the different strategies we looked at. They really varied from, well, no, no action being an option. Um, up through you know, temporary strategies such as sandbagging, temporary barriers, um, some that are put in place by hand ahead of time, some that are, um, are more uh, integral to the system. There's also ability to seal uh, certain buildings or, or, or rooms, uh, add barriers, flood proof equipment. Each individual piece of equipment can be flood proofed um, depending on the type of equipment. And finally, elevating equipment um, is typically uh, you know, a, a high resiliency level, low likelihood of failure, but also high high cost. So for a given asset or a given building, we looked at the different options and costed out typically um, a couple alternatives. So this table is intended to kind of summarize how we looked at um, the facilities. Um, and we looked at comparing the strategy costs that were determined to that benefit or that cumulative risk avoided. Um, so the table here, this is an example. This is Broad Creek Wastewater Pump Station. You can see the building or area of the facility there on the left, electrical yard, there's generator building, the pump station building itself, there's a screening building, valve vaults. Um, there's also a surge tank area that, that some equipment as well. Um, so this table is for all the assets at that particular facility. We also looked at and, and generated tables for those assets associated with the first and second level of service. So those like more critical wet weather condition assets. So we developed information for that as well, but this one is for all the assets that were determined to be at risk. So that quantity of assets is shown um, there. There's also a cost of replacement that was determined um, using that um, asset management uh, division data uh, that 
WSSC maintains and has really good records of all the different assets in each of these um, areas. Uh, we then determined the strategy cost, so that would have been um, through that uh, adaptation alternatives uh, process, we would have looked at uh, an accumulation of whatever strategies were deemed um, to be most suitable for um, that given building or area. That's the cumulative cost of those strategies. And then finally, on the right-hand side is the cumulative risk avoided. So that would be the sum of those annual risk avoided um, over the over the 20 assumed 20-year 20 service life of, of a given piece of equipment. Um, and you can see that some of them are looking more favorable than others. So what we uh, what we move forward with then are recommendations um, for the electrical yard, for the generator and the pump station building, which are the first three rows there, where you see that the cumulative risk avoided um, is exceeding the strategy cost, so that the calculated benefit is looking more favorable um, for those three. So these the next two slides are just. Uh, trying to, again, give a, a more graphical look at the results of doing this on a um, facility by facility basis. Um, you can see in this chart, the purple line is that cumulative risk uh, avoided the expected value of the benefit from um, not having that asset damage, from avoiding having to replace it and all, all of that. Um, and the blue bar is the strategy cost and you can there's two um, cost axes on here but it's just intended to show that um, you know the the strategy in in some cases the strategy cost and the cumulative risk um, are are divergent so it's helping to uh, help us illustrate which 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 projects or which adaptations are more uh, make more sense to pursue um, so this chart is looking at, again, the, the blue is a strategy cost, just as we looked at before, but here the purple is return on investment. So that um, net return per dollar strategy cost to um, further illustrate that some of, some of the uh, return on investment is, is much more favorable um, for, you know, given a given each of these facilities, the, the assessment's going to be a little bit different as to whether that's recommended to take place. I should say the strategy costs here are for the entire facility. So sometimes on a case by case, like different buildings or areas within the uh, facility may be more favorable to protect. Um, but on a facility basis, this gives a, an understanding of, of where that where that analysis is headed. Um, finally, another facet of the of the CC Bound project was to use the information developed over the period of, of doing the, the climate projections, the scenarios, the modeling, the vulnerability assessments, um, and the adaptation planning. Uh, we used all that information to develop a draft design guideline for protecting facilities from future climate extremes. So this guidance includes a number of different, it, it touches on a, uh, a number of different um, facets that um, should be taken into consideration for climate change. So um, we took the um, design flood elevations that were calculated for those areas where we did detailed study, provide um, criteria for other areas as well um, to provide like a future condition um, design flood elevation. We also um, had conductance some outfall tailwater um, analyses for the treatment processes, so that information is included, and so and the uh, climate projections. Um, developed for the for the uh, project were included as a site stormwater, site stormwater design guide, um, IDF, uh, rainfall data um, for, for WSSC's use going forward. Um, we also include some other facets, um, guidance for resiliency for INC or instrumentation, instrumentation and controls, which is a, a critical uh, component of, of the work that WSSC and other utilities do. Um, and then uh, we have some guidance for uh, obtaining greenhouse gas emissions information for new projects. So that's helping to um, facilitate the annual um, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation action plan that WSC carries out every year. So a myriad of things that are included in this design guide um, and that is um, currently being uh, reviewed by WSSC. 
Um, and I just have a picture there from a, I think that's Park, Parkway North substation, just um, illustrating one particular use of the design flood elevation um, that was calculated. So you can see there, put some uh, colored lines there to show the previous top of slab for that substation. It's in on the bottom there. So that's kind of ground surface elevation there. On the red line, you can see the 2016, um, so effective FEMA 100-year flood elevation, which would typically be the um, you know standard recommendation for uh, elevating a electrical substation for for such a facility. And then in the blue line, you can see that um, 2065 projected 100-year flood elevation. Um, so that we added a one-foot freeboard, and that constituted our design flood elevation um, for that facility. So that um that substation in the ground now um is benefiting from from our uh, our risk assessment we did and and that uh, detailed information that's available for for design so that got a couple of knowledge in here for the wsc water and jacobs folks that have helped but um that is the material that we were going to go through um for WSC water vulnerability assessment. And I believe now we'll have uh, Radu Zalparaki from Baltimore County talk to us about their um, storm drain uh, climate asset management program. So thank you guys. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the presenters, can you please verify that you're seeing the presentation screen as opposed to the presenter mode? Yep, I can see it. Okay. Just... So hello everyone, uh, I am Radu Zanfiraki, an engineer with the Baltimore County Public Works and Transportation. Um, our presentation, or my presentation, will be uh, centered around how we implemented yeah, the so current... So about, uh, Hello? Radu? Radu? Yes? Radu? Yes? Radu, sorry to break in. Could you please swap your screens? Could you please, could you please swap the screen? We're seeing your notes. Could you go to the display settings above the, the big slide? And... Is it... Uh, Click that and swap your screens for us, please. Is it good? Not good yet. You haven't swapped yet. There you go. Now, That's uh, it? Might be taking a little bit of time, so give me a moment. Uh, give me a moment. Give me a moment. I'm waiting. There you go. It looks fine. We good now? Yes, proceed. Okay. okay. All right, so um, my presentation will be talking more about how we implemented uh, the already developed Baltimore County Climate Action Plan or how we are planning to implement it um, and, and connect it to our storm drainage asset management program. Um, in order to get there, uh, I'll go um, a bit through the through the history of, of, um, of, uh, of Baltimore County and um, how we connect the, 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 the um, climate adaptation strategies uh, with our projections for climate impacts. Uh, Baltimore County is a large Maryland jurisdiction in central North Maryland surrounding the city of Baltimore and spanning from Arbutus and Hellthorpe in the south to the Mason-Dixon line in the north, from the Carroll County in the west, to Harford County and Chesapeake Bay in the east. Uh, it covers approximately square, 600 square miles and is home to a diverse sub suburban population of about 900,000 people. Our relief uh, varies extensively, pretty much like, uh, like Washington, D.C., uh, from uh, the high hilly terrain of the Piedmont to the, in the northwest to the coastal plains of the east-southeast. Uh, our citizenry is one of the most diverse in, in Maryland by race, culture, religion, political affiliation, education, and background. 
As a suburban administrative unit, Baltimore County lived through all of the ages of suburban development, from the county, uh, country homes developments of the late Gilded Age era, era of the 1900s, through the Roaring Twenties, the World War II heavy industrialization, well, we are home of what was Martin Marietta, the sub uh, suburbanization sprawl of 1950s and 60s, fed by Bethlehem Steel and, and heavy industry, uh, and to today's modern development and redevelopment. We saw them all and we know the problems of them all. On the drainage side, because this, that's what this presentation is going to be focused on, it ranges from the entirely unregulated old drainage of the 1900s through 1940s through the regulated but poorly thought out drainage of the 50s and 60s to today's different range of thought and drainage philosophy. All this makes us prime state for being both a showcase of issues and prime testing grounds for adaptation and strategic resilience building. The, tra uh, the, the presentation will talk about Baltimore County's efforts to steer towards a more, fle a more flexible response to the challenges brought about by the changes in climate with more in-depth look at the asset management system we developed in pursuit of an organized response to the challenges it poses to us. We need this system in order to know what we have, know how it fares, know how it functions and know what it does to our constituents, for our constituents. The latter is what is called the level of service and is this method that we pursue towards preservation and adaptation to present day challenges. Without further ado, let's look at how we plan for the challenges posed by the climate change. Let's start with Baltimore County's Climate Action Plan. This was a joint initiative of the county's Office of Sustainability and the county's largest custodian of public infrastructure, which is the Department of Public Works and Transportation. The DPWT, uh, part of the initiative, the book cover on the left, focuses exclusively on hydrologic and hydraulic challenges brought about by climate change which are increased flooding, more frequent and more intense storms, or the, the, which are the result of more, more frequent and more intense storms, sea level rise and associated effects. There is a separate response plan to address the other challenges posed by the, by the changing climate, uh, and it can review, be reviewed on the same web page presented at the top. What does the, our climate action plan do? Uh, it was developed by uh, uh, Hazen and Sawyer in, in, um, in 2020. Uh, it addresses the vulnerability and resiliency of the county-owned assets to climate change by, one, identifying the ranges of future, clim future climate change as used for impact evaluations. It's assessing the extent of potential impacts and it's recommending adaptation options for improving county assets, re assets resiliency with a planning horizon of 2050 and 2080. The ranges of climate change. Baltimore County chose to use a representative concentration pathway of 4.5 watts per square meter, the, the so-called stabilized emissions path, from the options presented by the Maryland Department of the Environment in its 2018 publication titled Sea Level Rise Projections. For sea level rise, Baltimore County chose to use the recommended likely range of 1.6 feet for 2050 and 2.6 feet in 2080 for the RCP 4.5 scenario as presented above. The values are at the conservative upper end of the 67% prob probability range, which we feel strikes a good balance between the likelihood of occurrence and the financial and technical constraints and implications. Port precipitation projections. The science is currently under development, but the county chose to recommend a 15% uniform increase in all storm design values for, pro for projects to be implemented through 2050, and then a 30% uniform increase in all storms de storm design values for work with a lifespan of 2080 and beyond. Using these assumptions, we conducted a comprehensive analysis of the impacts on county-owned or maintained infrastructure. We generated coastal inundation maps 
we mapped the historic streams that were piped through drainage networks. They are the ones that are certain and well-known source of inland flooding. We tabulated all county-owned assets and listed their criticality, which is how important they are, and vulnerability, which is how sensitive they are to, flood, to, sensitive they are to flooding. An augmented weight flag a factor, 1.5, was assigned to essential facilities such as police, fire, shelters, etc., on top of them being scored naturally at five the highest criticality. Non-county owned entities, hospitals, nursing homes, child care centers, etc., that were found to be impacted are also listed and weighted but are not included in, in, in evaluation any further. The plan is public and we certainly hope that these non-general government entities are and have become aware of these, of these findings. We incorporated the nuisance flooding analysis in this climate action plan. We define nuisance flooding as being anything up to 1.75 feet above the mean higher high water of the tidal readings at the Baltimore Harbor Station. We identified all county road segments that would get affected by nuisance flooding under the 2020, 2050 and 2080 tidal ranges records and projections. 121 sewer pumping stations that the county owns and operates were also evaluated. The results are pre presented in the body of the appendix and uh, in the body of the report and in appendix I. Last but not least, we conducted an emergency response analysis as a measure of the level of service our transportation provides. When free, flooding when free of flooding constraints, the leftmost map, then when stressed by flooding, rightmost map, due to the flow, block due to the flow blo blockages depicted in the middle map. The result of this effort is the mapping of the road segments that should constitute a funding priority for retrofitting in order to avoid the degradation of service. Now, what does the study recommend we do? The study produced an adaptation catalog detailing actions that we as a county would take to mitigate the listed threats. The catalog this, uh, this describes threats that are mitigated and unit costs presented as either net dollars per unit or as a percentage of the project cost. So this is so that was the summary of the uh, county's climate action plan. What is the common thread here? It is the flooding. What is responsible for flooding? Drainage impairments. Drainage system malfunctions or drainage system providing an inadequate level of service. So it all has to do with drainage in the end. So then let's talk a bit about drainage. The drainage system, what is it? As always and everywhere, drainage starts on a tree leaf or on a roof or a building. It comes down through downspouts, then flows over land, through swales and ditches to any of our 51,000 inlets working to collect runoff to the best of their ability. Through nearly 1,500 miles of pipes and various other drainage structures, discharging through our more than 8,000 outfalls, and then the water eventually goes to our 2,100 miles of stream and ultimately into the Chesapeake Bay, which fronts Baltimore County with 200 miles of shoreline. Built into the whole system is the stormwater management component, uh, comprised of about 1,500 public and 2,300 private stormwater management ponds. Who administers it all? Well, uh, from the drainage divide to the conveyance system depends on, uh, on land ownership, if, the, if it's public, is our department public works and transportation. Same goes for the conveyance system to the stormwater management. Then the stormwater management in Baltimore County from the, from the practice to its outfall is administered by, by our Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability. And from there on, the natural conveyances uh, are regulated for the jurisdictional determination. Floodplains, for all floodplains uh, related matters, they are still administered by the, by the Department of Public Works and Transportation. Now let's talk a bit about our drainage asset management system because that's where the results of our climate action plan have been integrated. First of all, why we need it. For starters, the, 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 the drainage system is on average 50 to 70 years old. 
it's mostly concrete and corrugated metal pipe sized to carry the 10% st storms by the old TP40 standard. Main purpose is to secure rapid elimination of rainwater out of sight, out of mind. Stretched out to cover the explosive, explosive sprawl of the Baltimore suburbs between 1950s and 90s, much of it without the benefit of any stormwater management whatsoever. Monitoring and tracking, chronically underfunding. We do not re really know how well the grain infrastructure works, what and where the problems are, what to do about issues, and how to prioritize potential flooding. All this infrastructure and its problem, problems are in need of an organized management system. We had to come up with, with one, so let's talk a bit what we assembled to, gov to govern it all. So what we call in abbreviated talk as STAM. It translates to stormwater drainage asset management. The, the, it is centered around developing a decision support system relying on four components. The field documentation of drainage asset conditions, the condition, connectivity, and geometry. Drainage complaints and concerns evaluation. So that is evaluating the public feedback on how the system works. The, drain, the, the drainage assets vulnerability to climate change, that is an input that is imported from our climate action plan. And then the drainage assets current runoff capacity, which is based on uh, PC swim modeling of the existing systems. Now a few details about, about uh, how, it, how it all works together. All assets are ranked and evaluated to produce the input of the decision support system model. SDAM is based on the generation of a pair of likelihood of failure versus consequence of failure matrices for each asset category of the assets. The matrices are then transposed to a color-coded level of service map. The map is used to evaluate remediation measures capable of restoring the level of service to its initial value or as close as you possibly can come to it. Let's dive a bit into the details of the four modules supporting SDAM. Asset condition. Evaluates the condition of the brainy system based on a suite of criteria developed in-house and implemented via CityWorks software. This is a screenshot of, of, um, of an asset condition assessment questionnaire. In CityWorks, it's organized again by assets such as inflow pour points, manholes, drainage swales, etc. The operator or the inspector follows through a series of screens answering sets of questions assembled by us. Prompts and warnings are built into the, into the forms, into the, for, into the uh, questionnaires that they fill up to help guide the operator during the inspection. Public feedback evaluation, complaints and concerns analysis. It's another, it's a ranking system, uh, well, it's based on the ranking system developed in-house based on history of dealing with drainage related issues. For the analysis of the public feedback, we developed the, the, the matrix, the, 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 as I mentioned before, it's presented on the left. Climate and the impacts. This is where we are inputting the, the outcome of the climate action plan. And the last module consists of the evaluation of the drainage network's uh, capacity to, to collect and convey runoff, uh, again based on PC Swim software, which is generally used across the industry for this purpose. We are currently testing the whole system on six pilot drainage areas, four of them are complete. And the outcome of the, of the whole process is a map like you see on the screen in which uh, the, the segments that are more, most critical are or, pri or should be prioritized for rehabilitation are marked in red, the ones that have a moderate risk are in blue, and the ones that are generally okay are in green. As everywhere, we face challenges in all this. The entire SDAM uh, depends on a programmatic policy, and such policy needs, needs steady funding. 
Steady funding requires a dedicated revenue stream. We estimate that the whole SDAM for Baltimore County would cost 40 to 51 million dollars. That's in money as of the summer and to take between seven and a half and ten years to complete. Revenue streams need to be around five million per year for the SDAM to advance to be fully implemented. Revenue stream for SDAM and for running the resiliency pro program does not easily fit or work with grant type funding, uh, which are a lot more project focused. Using a 5% SDAM mitigation to, uh, to mitigation cost ratio, we can build resilient drainage infrastructure with a time horizon of 2080 to 2100, so resilient through 2080 to 2100, at the cost of approximately $1 billion over the next decade. A cost that sounds like a lot, but it's in, in fact quite comparable or even, only a bit slightly higher than the final projected cost for all the work that the county would need to implement in order to meet the EPA's consent decree mandates that we're under for our sanitary sewers network. Other challenges, and these are common currently across the industry. Personnel, it's hard to find. Everybody's hiring, hard to hire, hard to retain. Capital absorption, that's a, a major issue that is not much talked about, but is very much present and, and uh, an imperative. Money is not everything that we need. We need consultants and contractors capable of spending money effectively and efficiently. Then that the regulatory monitoring and supervision, too often regulation comes with monitoring or reporting mandates that are passed along to the regulated, due to lack of staffing and lean budgets upstream. These divert resources away from the implementation interface, bureaucratic complexity in securing grants and single event funding, approval to submit application accompanied by 100 plus guides. Uh, that's really not helpful when we don't have the personnel to go through all that. And then there is a lack of uniform abilities and regional standardization, common approaches among local jurisdictions. Everyone seems like they want to do something, but not on the same page on what to do or what is the goal. With that, um, that is the summary of, our, of my presentation for all questions and all we are now open to discussion. Thank you, Radu. And thank you also to, um, to Miranda and Lawrence as well. Um, throughout this webinar, we've been assembling questions from our audience and we'll now move into our question and answer session. We have a lot of good questions um, and you can, but that said, you can continue submitting questions as we move into the discussion. And um, although we, we and we'll see, we, we may um, extend the time if, if necessary past 2.30 um, if, if folks want to stay and if we have um, too many questions to fill, um, even just over the 30 minutes. So we have a lot of great questions here and um, I'm trying to decide where to begin um, because of all the great questions here. I think one interesting question that struck me um, had to do had to do with impacts to um, and consideration of sorry about to social impact. So I'm, I'm getting to that question right now. Um, so here's a question from from a, one of our, our listeners. Um, so how does um, the Jacobs plan in particular account for impacts to customers served? Um, so for example, um, accounting for likely damage, sorry, accounting for the risk to customers of losing water and wastewater services. So basically the impact of those customers in particular, and then also consideration of, of which populations would be affected as well. Um, so the thought is, has Jacobs um, considered that aspect of this type of analysis? And given that that could tip the balance in terms of which projects get prioritized, especially from an equity perspective. I'll, I'll take a stab at that and then uh, Miranda can chime in. Um, for WSSC water, um, we didn't do that directly, but WSSC, it was, our work fed into a broader enterprise risk management framework that they had. Um, so they, they, they looked at the uh, indirect impact on their customers. So the work that we did focus on the impact of assets um, and then 
given the possibility of a, a given facility failing, they would fit that into their broader framework. They, they do actually have a rating of different facilities based on uh, the types of customers that a given facility would serve, and that figured into how they took the ranking based on asset risk um, uh, into that assessment. Um, a separate project that we've done actually did that work directly where you actually delineate the service area of each facility. You can actually estimate the uh, loss of, of service to customers and build that into your overall risk assessment. And interestingly enough, you know, those indirect impacts sometimes are greater than the direct impacts on customers. And one last point is for yet a third client of ours, uh, actually in Maryland, another one in, in Virginia, where we're looking more broadly, very similar to Radu, what to what you showed, where we look at the flood um, boundaries associated with storm drainage systems, we are looking at social vulnerability as part of the ranking of projects using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. So um, while we didn't do it directly ourselves for WSSC, it certainly is done, and it's a very good question. Thank you, and that was a question from Giacomo Yaquinto, um, and I have a few other questions about uh, from different folks related to um, to funding. Um, so this may cover several of your questions, but um, for both Radu and for um, for Miranda and Lawrence, what sources of funding um, did you use to to make this happen? And then um, also, what fun, what sources of funding are available to pursue studies? Um, in the first place. So, thank you. Okay, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll uh, start off on this one. Um, so, for what, what has already been done for the Climate Action Plan and for the pilot of the of the ASDAM system, we've used uh, capital funding. So, we used internal Baltimore County funding. In terms of what sources of funding are available to expand this. As I said, we're going to 40 to $50 million countywide to implement the ISDAM all around. Um, we are actually looking into establishing a resiliency authority in the model of Charles County and the city of Annapolis, whose job will be specifically to identify revenue sources. It is a major lift um, a, uh, a very taxing investment and um, well unlike the sanitary sewer system in our county we're not under a consent decree so we cannot just simply add the cost to the tax bill uh, there will have to be all kinds of creative financing that will have to come into place um, we looked at grants and there's lots of grants out there that um, are dedicated even for study level work, uh, many that are coming through ARPA. Uh, however, the, the grant system is, as I said, pretty unwieldy and, and complex. And let's not forget we live in pretty challenging economical times uh, in between the inflation and the threat of recession and all that. Uh, contractors are not extremely eager to hire and the ones that are eager to hire don't find any personnel so that puts us in a sort of a bind where it's difficult really to to do both funding and absorption of funds nonetheless it is a known fact um, it is a known problem um, as Malcolm said in the beginning we don't have the luxury in in, uh, in, in public works or WSSC's keys, um, the regional utility, we don't have the luxury to debate who's at fault about climate change. We just got to deal with it because that's hitting, it's hitting hard our constituents just like it does WSSC's clients. I'll take a Thank stab for know. WSSC and I, I don't know if Malcolm is, is on the call, maybe he has a better sense of this, but the actual project, the the Resilience Plan, CC VAMP for WSSC, did also, just like Radu said, came out of the, uh, I think in their case, it was an operating budget, not their capital budget, but it, it came from existing uh, sources. And as Radu said, the real challenge is how do you how do you pay for the implementation of the, the various recommendations? Um, 
I'm not exactly sure how WSOC is planning on doing that. I know other customers are planning a combination of um, existing funds, but uh, equally important, they're actually going out to uh, funds available for, through the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure bill. For example, our JEA client in Jacksonville, Florida, they actually have gone after FEMA brick monies. There's some Florida state monies through through HUD. Um, so that it's it's uh, everyone's going after these grant sources, I think, at the same time um, from from federal dollars. But it's still a challenge. The so one other point I wanted to make, though, is the incremental cost of investing in resilience we find is relatively small compared to the cost of, say, doing a, a system upgrade. I'm not talking about waste um, the drainage systems, but if you're upgrading a, a wastewater plant or upgrading a, a, a pump station because you have to because of renewal and replacement or capacity needs adding that incremental change as in the example miranda showed of, of raising um raising a transformer um i think it was at uh, the wssc's parkway facility that incremental cost is proportionally relatively small to the overall cost of improving capacity or, or retrofitting a, a facility for other reasons Thus, the importance of actually having the plan in the first place, so that you you know when you do those other things um, to build in resilience as part of your as part of your broader design. Thanks, Lawrence. That's yeah, that's a tremendously helpful um, answer there as well. And um, I have a follow-up question, Radu, um, related to funding uh, from Richard Woodroff. Um, does Baltimore County have a stormwater utility fee uh, based on impervious surface ERU, that is the equivalent residential unit, that produces revenue for capital projects? And, and, and would any of that funding help be helpful in this work? Um, no, Baltimore County does not have such a fee currently. It held one for about a year, and um, the local authorities decided that other revenue streams would have been available at the time and they're still available today to mitigate for TMDL compliance because that's what stormwater management fee was initially authorized to pay for. It wouldn't have paid. Let's not forget it's the 2012 uh, stormwater management fee. It would not have paid for uh, mitigation of flooding and this type of projects. It would have been law limited to pay towards that. Uh, so the county um, repealed it, the, the local council repealed it and chose to fund TMDL work through other means within the county budget. Thank you, Radu. Um, this the next couple of questions or three questions all relate to other types of climate change impacts. Um, so the first one, I'm going to ask all three and then have you answer. Um, the first one is from John Hayes. He asks, um, climate change in the mid-latitudes is one of extremes, both in terms of bigger storm events, but also more frequent extended in the hotter heat waves. Were extreme droughts covered in the climate action plans? Um, I saw that high temperatures were considered and the 104 degree Fahrenheit threshold, but what about the extreme lack of precipitation? Um, that's one question. Um, next question related to other types of climate change impacts. Um, this one is from John Hayes as well. Um, saltwater intrusion was not discussed. Um, has a consideration been related to the degradation of components of, of, of stormwater um, drainage systems, et cetera, near the coast. And um, lastly, I know there was one other um, question here, which is from Nick Sparacio. Um, for any of the speakers, we typically think of temperature rise with climate change, but did any of the vulnerability assessments consider the impacts of prolonged extreme cold conditions? And if so, what kind of issues and adaptations were identified? He's from the upper Midwest. Um, thank you. I'm happy to jump in, but Radu, if you want to go first, it's up to you. Uh, fine. We'll, we'll alternate. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so the first question had to do with other types of extremes, including drought. Um, while we didn't do that directly, WSSC water um, is part of something called the. Uh, well, it's in 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 part in the uh, Potomac River Basin. There's an entity called the. Uh, 
uh, oh gosh, what's it called? The Potom Potomac River Basin Commission. I'm pro probably not doing any service right now, but they have a separate study that was ongoing looking at drought concerns for the large reservoirs in the Potomac River Basin. Um, and so that's what um, WSC, WSSC was relying on. They also had some reservoirs on the Patuxent, which they'd done separate studies. So point being that they have looked at that. It just wasn't part of our, our particular effort, which focused more on flood risk. Um, it's definitely a critical issue. We have clients out west, that is their primary focus. Um, saltwater intrusion is definitely an issue if you rely on groundwater. WSSC does not. Their system is entirely surface water driven. We have other clients along the coast and down in Florida where saltwater intrusion is a huge issue. So it definitely needs to be considered if you're doing climate uh, vulnerability and risk assessments uh, in those situations. And again, extreme cold, similar issue, not not really a huge driver for WSC, although they are concerned about extreme storms. Um, we've had, uh, there was a derecho event uh, where it was extreme wind event that knocked out much of the power here about a decade or so ago. So they're concerned about power resiliency and redundancy. So that was actually part of our study looking at uh, uh, electric reliability to their facilities. Um, somewhat similar, I guess to what you're thinking about with extreme cold, what happened in, in uh, the, the lo lower central states in, in the US where the power system went out. Um, so they have definitely looked at those types of issues. Okay. Um, I hope I, I jotted them down all, all, all the aspects. So um, as far as drought and the uh, lack of precipitation, so first of all, I'm, I'm gonna qualify to that as far as uh, heat, drought, um, atm uh, atmospheric events beyond uh, drainage, we have that second climate action plan that deals with that entire aspect. I have not been personally involved with it. I saw it there, I, I read through it, so th th there's limited knowledge in terms of, of that I have over its content. But um, Getting back to the questions, so as far as the, the drought and extreme lack of precipitations, um, the one thing that we in drainage and in engineering did notice in Baltimore County is it's flooding that hits us most. Drought, at least in our climate, which is really, I mean, if you look at Baltimore County, it's around Catonsville where they draw the line between subtropical and, and uh, temperate climate. Uh, but the climate in there is generally unsettled, but if anything, it trends a lot towards increased frequency of extreme storm events. That's what we have. Um, that, that's what climate change uh, endows us with. Uh, it, it's a lot of localized, in very intense short duration downpours that absolutely startle everyone, create a lot of damage, and it, it's making it difficult for us to respond. Uh, Saltwater intrusion, um, again, we are, um, it's, it's not a major component in our area in that that the majority of the of the developments inside the urban, the urban rural delineation line relies on public water, and uh, that is not affected by saltwater intrusion. Um, the um, the salt issues that we have are of a different nature. So, in, as far as drainage is concerned, in, impacts on drainage. Um, yes, we we do have a major problem in between the. 50s and like 80s, all developers put down a lot of car corrugated metal uh, pipe. Um, the thing just doesn't like salt. So it's uh, we regard it as an annoyance issue, but it's a mighty big annoyance because it's everywhere and there's sinkholes everywhere and a lot of issues that derive out of it. So in that way, salt is an issue. And um, it is also uh, well, the salting of the roads is not for nothing that Maryland considers a PNDL for salt. Um, there are in, in the parts of the county that are rural, that are outside the, the, the delineation line, there is a lot of salt intrusion. It, it doesn't have to do with salt water, like bay salt water. Actually, the bay is not all that salty up, 
up all the way anyways. It's, it's a lot more brackish. Um, but in, in, uh, there is a lot of salt coming from the, the road surface treatment during the winter that impacts a lot of people's uh, wells. Um, and as far as extreme cold versus extreme heat, um, that's that. I, there, there are plans that the county has on on uh, retrofitting, retrofitting its assets and its buildings and its uh, infrastructure in a way that better responds to extreme heat. Uh, as far as extreme cold, well, we do get we do get. Uh, cold winters up this way, uh, we're used to, to dealing with it. So that's not a, uh, a major issue that I've seen raised in terms of, of uh, need for increasing resiliency. Thank you, Radu. Um, one other yeah. thing I'd add, Jason, oh, sorry, Malcolm, but one other thing I'd add on the saltwater intrusion point, not, not for WC, it's not, um, a driver there, but there there are other clients that we have that are interested in looking at not the saltwater intrusion side on the water supply, but on the wastewater side, the impact of sea level rise or high groundwater on septic systems, um, infiltration type uh, wastewater treatment systems. So that is something that others in the more um, coastal region are looking at, but um, not part of this study, of course. Yeah. Um... That, uh, from the utilities perspective, I was just going to mention that. So a couple of our collection systems are subject to high levels of I&I. &I. The vast majority of the collection systems um, are very close to at or below sea level. And so when the groundwater table during high tide, as an example, um, is above our collection system, the I&I is actually in, uh, um, affected by sea level. So that's indicated by a higher increase in dissolved salts. We have not seen that yet, but I think what that lends to is in addition to spending um, money and efforts in, in detailed assessments and looking at infrastructure, a critical element of this plan is for us on the utility side to look at operational data and to look at a historical trends and start to look for changes. If we start to see the dissolved solids in our influence start to kind of gradually um, <clears throat> increase over time to sort of take a step back and to suggest as to why is that. We have also noticed in certain instances we have had some issues with uh, maybe nitrification uh, to correlate those periods of maybe inhibited nitrification to cold weather snaps again is a is an element that I think the utilities can do somewhat independent of specific assessments to just trending data, looking for changes and correlating them to the things that are going around them um, as again, sort of a, hey, something's a little different here and why is that? So I, I do think that uh, monitoring past performance as it as it relates to data and, and subjective changes is, is part of this strategy for sure. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Miranda. Um, that was very helpful. Um, switching to one of the other issues um, related to having enough, um, well, let me just read it directly. This is from Jim George. Um, can you all speak to the ways that capital absorption is being addressed or being considered? Is the U.S. attracting talent from outside the United States and are universities or trade schools giving this issue consideration? Okay. Uh... I guess we said one and one the other. Uh, okay, let's um, let's look a bit at, at what kind of capital absorption issues we have. Um, and our experience is that it's not a lack of knowledge capital that is hitting us. Um, fortunately, we have a very competent and very expansive source of talent in all of our consultants, uh, very highly qualified people, um, lots of ability to not only figure out the problems, but figure out how to go about them too, planning, design. That's, that's not something that we're really encountering as a, as an, as a, as a complication. 
um, access to overseas knowledge. Oh yes, absolutely. They do. We do. Uh, we, this is a community that um, I won't say it's it's tight in by, by any measure, but there is a lot of exchange of information in all kinds of ways um, in between us and them. The problem that we encounter of capital absorption is, as I put it in, in my presentation, is the economical, is the implementation side. Um, the consultants, I have yet to run into one that cannot do a project. Okay, I'll put it that way. Uh, as far as construction and contractors, as it stands today, I have to run into one that can do the project. Between a uh, source of supply problems and, and supply chain, uh, inability to find workforce, and inability to maintain personnel. I mean, uh, there's the turnover is is not just spectacular. It's it, it's got to the point where it is toxic. We there we are. We we hire the contractor just to find out a year later he's left with 50% of the workforce and told me flat out, I simply can't do the project. Like, I don't want to, I can't. Uh, so that's that's where we're hitting a wall as it stands. And um, the reality is, as I said, money is not everything. You must be able to use them if you want to reach any end. And um, the problem is, you know, you, you're building up projects, uh, you're putting them together, and then you have no way of implementing them so you put them on a shelf and by the time you may have an ability to implement them 10 years from now they are outdated and it's uh it's almost like you know a, a specific job you just keep on pushing that boulder up the hill for years to come and throw it down back at the bottom uh, so that's kind of our take on it and it's uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's the way out and it's not my job to be sure what's the way out of that cycle but that cannot prevent us from simply observing the cycle. Thank you, Radu and Lawrence or Miranda. Do you have anything to add on that? I mean, I guess you guys are the ones absorbing the capital, but. I'd like to say I, we're we're competing more favorably with the local government, but not necessarily the <laughs> for 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 talent. Uh, Radu described it well. I mean, I think we're all experiencing this across the entire industry, both uh, um, lack of talent in terms of actually doing the engineering, but also the actual construction work. It's it's in supply chain. You know, cost of steel is going up, cost of supplies is going up. Our our approach to the the talent issue is is mostly to work with universities you know work, work at the very very start of the pipeline and make sure we're encouraging folks even in high schools we're now, we're now trying to encourage folks to you know please go into the stem field it's uh but that's obviously a very very long term play you know <laughs> it takes a long time for that to really show up but even when you hire really talented folks for one year out of school um it takes a while before they get effective in their jobs even if they're super smart <laughs> Can attest to that. I think I am mentioning, but yeah, we're doing, and yes, Lawrence, we are competing all over. <laughs> all for everybody's hiring. That's what happens when everybody's hiring. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we do go. We, we do bring bring people out of the universities, and big kudos to our colleagues that spend their weekends at job fairs and presenting what mm -hmm. we offer and and showing everyone what a great life is working for the county. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that's something we do all the time. Lawrence said, uh, fresh graduates. This is not, you know, something you buy a screwdriver and start driving screws. No, it, it takes a while for them to to reach the point where they can work independently and produce results. It, it, it's a training period that uh, it's three to five years. That's that's kind of how it goes. It's not easy. So um, yeah. That's, Thank you. To both. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting question about the. Um, this is from Michael Bloom. Um, how did Jacobs and, and also Baltimore County? How did you handle the issue of compound flooding um, from both rainfall and storm surges happening at the same time? Um, the question comes up uh, an awful lot. Um, we we tend to, well. First of all, we do 
model them as though they're happening at the same time. And of course, the next question is always, what is the joint probability of those types of events? Uh, that definitely can be calculated, but to be honest, we we find that you know it's uh, you're, you're kind of chasing your tail with trying to to um, figure out what is the the, the joint probability of different types of events. We prefer to take a uh, scenario planning perspective, try to bookend the whole range of possible scenarios that might occur. So you do your riverine modeling by itself, you can do your coastal modeling by itself, but like in the Potomac River Basin, you know you have you can have the possibility of a storm surge coming up the river at the same time as extreme rainfall bringing water down the Anacostia at the same time. Um, so we, we've run the model uh, together with those two things at the same time and just try to, view, to look at the, uh, um, the resulting action. But again, it's a scenario planning exercise. You sort of do low probability events, high probability events. Usually the lower probability will, uh, sorry, the more frequent events will look at riverine by itself because it's really unlikely you're going to have a storm surge at the same, same time as a riverine type event. Um, and that's the approach we've been taking to it. You can get really, really analytical and academic about it. And I guess my point is it's best not to get too, too uh, analytical because then you get into uh, analysis paralysis, as like, I like to say. I'd much rather, again, try to bookend the likely scenarios that might happen and look at all of those. And then, then it's just a, a risk assessment. It's professional judgment. You know, what is your comfort for or what's your tolerance for risk? And you decide based on the scenarios where you want to fall in that spectrum. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Chuck Boyd. Um, this is a question related to do, when doing a vulnerability assessment of local government's facilities, um, that appears to require a good inventory of your facilities with elevations of different components um, delineated for each of those. Do you have any guidance on how to develop that type of inventory? Where should folks start? Okay, I'll, 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 if we get onto that one, uh, yes, we uh, actually we do have a complete inventory of all this information. So our climate action plan is, and, and it's captured, it captured in our GIS system, and our climate action plan was built around that. So we knew exactly where it was and where it is, with height wise, what's happening, and that. Well, yeah, ties into the pre uh, preceding question as well. But um, yeah, now that there's, um, we used it for before before all of our analysis, so we do have an inventory advantage. And one thing I usually like to say is, if you've already done an asset management plan where you have the asset inventory, you're halfway to the hard job of doing climate risk assessments. That's, so your question is an excellent one. You do have to have a good inventory. Oftentimes the elevation data is what's missing. You know, you might know what you have, but not necessarily, uh, I mean, you usually know where it is inside a building, but not necessarily the vertical. It's quite common, say, if you have an inventory of your pipe system, as Rod was talking about, you may not have the pipe inverts throughout the system. So usually then what the recommendation is, is to, you know, do a high level vulnerability assessment using assumptions and, once you figure out where the likelihood is of of having or, uh, facilities at risk, only then do you go out and do the, the actual survey type data. We will, in the case of WSC, we visited every single facility. They had an inventory, but they didn't have the elevations. But it was after we narrowed it down from those 200 or so facilities down to 18, as we showed in that one slide, it was only those 18 facilities that were critical that we went out and visited them. And we physically measured what is the, the elevations of, you know, your electrical panels, your, your INC systems, your motors above the first floor elevation. And oftentimes that data is available on as-built, so you don't necessarily need to go in the field. But, you know, you want to limit the effort as much as you can. The inventory is was a great starting point, but we still had to go get the elevation information. I'd be curious, actually, Radu, do you actually in your inventory have all the pipe inverts? Because that's often been the challenge for us. That's that I, I was going to chime into that. Uh, we we have the ability to capture inverts, and we chose not to when we digitized our system. Mm -hmm. The reason why we did that is because they are not reliable. How reliable can a 1950s invert be today? <laughs> That's why when we're moving into the SDAM, we have a field inspection component. This field inspection actually goes and measures inverts. 
and our PC swim models are based off of the readings. Um, that's how we pursued this this aspect of it. Um, as for the buildings, and, and again, a, a climate action plan, let's not forget what it is. It is a plan, it's not a project, it's not an engineering project. So for that purpose, the GIS derived first floor elevation, we regard that as satisfactory. For our sanitary sewer pumping stations, uh, which were where we relied on, on a previously developed plan, and they actually did go, and as, as Lawrence said, they um, uh, measured the, the all, all the relevant elevation in the pumping station. Uh, but yes, overall, in, in our drainage system, we are capturing the configuration, the condition, and the elevations as part of our field inspection exercise. That's part of the SVAM. And just Thank to you. add to that, Douglas the C had really good um, asset information with replacement costs, which really fed a lot of the analyses we did. But like Lauren said, we worked through a process to make sure that we were being pretty efficient about going out to the site so that you know we had the modeling results, we were able to do that screening and understand the vectors and which areas of the site we're most interested in to really uh, focus when we went out um, in in the field and said, okay, well, you know, this building, we actually, let's confirm uh, what's in it and, and are able to kind of mitigate the impact on the operation staff and whatnot. Um, but just keeping, uh, doing a thorough as-built review in our case helped a lot because they had such good records and you could take the floor elevation, for example, and get you know, do the measurements and and be able to understand the vulnerability of each asset just based on that information and in most part, and then we're able to gather um, those areas that we didn't know so that the survey was done pretty efficiently altogether, um, you know, getting getting whatever spot elevations we needed to fill in the gaps. Thank you, Miranda. So the next question is um, for um, Jacobs and it's from Damian Cernick and Samantha Thomas had the same type of question. Um, can you tell us for the design guide for protecting facilities from future climate extremes, is that something that would be available to the public? Probably need to ask Malcolm Taylor that question. <laughs> I suspect the answer is yes, but I have to double check with WSOC. Could you please okay. repeat the question? Sure. Yeah. The question. The question is, um, will the um, the guideline and and I actually unfortunately just deleted the full name of it. But do the guidelines? Um, I don't, Lawrence, can you re repeat the name of the actual guidelines? I apologize. Yeah. It's it's essentially design guidelines for flood resilience uh, at WSSC facilities. Actually, I don't think it's been finalized. We prepared a draft that's being uh, integrated into a broader set of design standards at WSSC. So the question, Malcolm, was, is that available for sharing with folks on this call? Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it's currently under development and reassessment um, because in large part, the design guidelines we had for years and years are proving to be outdated. Um, so I, I don't think at current we have anything uh, to share, but I can double check and then if possible, I can work with the organizers to send it out to attendees. Well, that would just be to, wonderful. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate what those design guidelines are that we prepared, you know, Miranda went through that. We have actual flood elevations at each of the 18 facilities with the design flood elevation for those. There's also some more general recommendations on electrical uh, resilience and redundancy measures that could be considered. And then the actual uh, rainfall-based projections. So if they do design a future uh, site drainage on a facility, you know, rather than design to, to today's 10-year storm or TP40, as Radu said they historically did, that's very common for old systems. If you're gonna replace those and do some site improvements, you know, look at planning for the projected future 10-year storm. So it has a level service still being maintained at the end of the service life of those assets. So those are the type of elements in that uh, the, the draft design guidelines we've given to WSSC. But as Malcolm said, they're they're revamping the rest of their standards. So this needs to be integrated with that. Well, that's great. Well, I'll definitely coordinate with Malcolm on the availability of those and um, 
and uh, we can there should be a way for us to post it um, along with the the webinar <clears throat> if it's available. So um, I have another question. This one is for Radu. This is from Chuck Boyd. Um, based on your work on the storm water drainage asset management system, have has the county changed its standard facility designs for stormwater drainage um, components and systems? And if so, do you have any recommendations to other local governments regarding facility designs? Uh, okay, well, that's basically the, 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 the same question as it is to, to our level. Uh, so the short answer is not yet. Um, not because we think it's not necessary, but sim uh, simply because well, we're just completing the pilot of the SM. Um, drawing the conclusions and figuring out what to do as far as design is concerned is a is a major undertaking. Um, this, I mean, it is a government institution. Whatever changes we do make, it will be in the county's design manual, uh, of which we, engineering in DPWT, are the custodians of. Um, we are starting to work, actually, pretty much as we speak, on updating our guidelines. Um, there are steps that have to be taken in there, and these steps take time. We have to go through public hearings. We have to go through feedback from developers and engineers. That's after we reach an internal consensus over what we want to do. Um, design guidelines have tremendous impacts in all regards and in all directions um, in the development industry, in the economic outlook of the county. Uh, so these are not something that we can just put on a piece of paper and publish it out there. It's something that has to be looked through and thought through very deeply. Um, the county doesn't do bad in keeping its standards up to date, at least by government standards. Our latest round was in 2010 to that, and they are only 12 years old. We know jurisdictions that have 50, 60, 70 years old uh, design guidelines. So, uh, in a nutshell, absolutely, we're going to put the provisions to look for resiliency. Well, the Climate Action Plan, as I said, it recommends a 15% uh, increase in the, we're going to start talking like lawyers and say in, in the current um, um, precipitation values, I won't say anymore NOAA 14 because I know the NOAA 15 is in the works and that's going to be even better modeled in local, um, in the local character of the weather. Uh, so whatever that is, we'll be putting 15% on top of it for um, drainage to be designed uh, to, to expect a service life through 2050 and then a 30% of the PED and above. If we learned anything, and I mean, we can go very deep in the, in the, in the woods there, but um, we, we figured out that we can not continue just design to one standard storm and roll it over happily left and right. It just doesn't that way. Uh, it, it would be extremely expensive and it would be pretty insane to start digging up 1800 miles of storm drains and make them bit bigger. Uh, insane in all respects, insane in price, insane, insane in, 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 in consequences in all regards possible. We're looking actually, what, what we did figure out is that much of the runoff needs to be held up into the drainage area. Um, in which way? Well, there's green infrastructure, there's surface, there's surface drainage. A lot of, of the flooding issues have to do really with the lack of any storm conveyance mechanism. Let's not forget we're talking about the areas inside the earth where entire streams, rivers, have been putting pipes and houses built on top of it. That can't be resilient. We can't make streams to flow in pipes just because we want them to. They will flood. So uh, the, the resiliency means not just working on the infrastructure end. It means working intelligently all around. If we need to to um, open up land and open up the streams back and let them let stream the streams, that's where the policy needs to trend, and we fully understand that. Um, so that's why uh, yes, we have. That's a very long answer to what seemed like a simple question, but. Uh, yes, we are looking to build resiliency in our in our design guidelines in terms of 
how and in which way there are many directions in which we have to go and there's a lot of thought that has to go into it before we bankrupt the company all around so um that's that's kind of all of it well thank you radu i think i have time for just one last question for folks um and uh, this question is is just um generally um how what are your thoughts about how this can increase costs to uh, taxpayers and to you know, those receiving service from your utilities? Um, how can that affect uh, potentially affordability of of, of living um, in certain areas, that sort of thing, housing, et cetera? Okay, I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, flooding is not cheap all around. Uh, it, it's a, we've got with FEMA to the point where they no longer want to subsidize living in risky conditions. That's the thing. Uh, it costs an awful lot of money to keep rebuilding what storms and floods keep coming and destroying. Um, what will be the cost impact to the general population? I'd like to be able to provide an answer to that. Um, it's it's not going to be cheap, and it again it depends on on a multitude of factors. It depends on what people in the end will decide to do. Do they want to continue living in very high risk areas? There will have to be some sort of a shift of responsibility for that risk. Um, do we want to practice more of a strategic retreat with all the costs that that comes with? Well, then that will need to happen in some way. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's impossible at this point in time to say, oh, it's going to cost one billion or five or a hundred or. Uh, it really depends on on the direction in which pretty much every single singular jurisdiction will decide to to go in. Okay, thank you, Radu. Hey, Miranda. Oh, I just like to, yeah, I think just in general, knowing knowing where the risk lies is, is perhaps the first um, step. So both of these efforts, um, eating, you know, the the utility and the municipality of knowing where the, the risk is, and that can um, also benefit um, the utility for planning. I mean, of course, prioritizing um, work that that should be suitably prioritized, but making sure that they're keeping an eye on future risk for um, bond rating purposes or other um, reasons too. So it's it's a it's a measure that hopefully will help um, help plan and help help the adaptation be more affordable because of that forward thinking. Thanks, Miranda. Yes, Lawrence. I mean, I, I would echo what, what both Radu and, and Miranda said. I just w want to emphasize that last point, which is that the you know, the cost of no action is is considerably higher than, than the cost of some action. The question is, as Radu points out, you know, who's going to bear those costs? It's it's unrealistic to expect the local government is going to be solving all these flooding problems. A lot of the flooding that we're experiencing is not even in uh, FEMA floodplains. It's uh, you know ur urban flooding that's well outside of the the FEMA zones. Um, and you know the insurance industry bond rating agency all these folks are starting to ask those questions like you know if you've got re repetitive losses you know is is it worth it so um worth rebuilding the answer is probably no at a certain point you know repetitive losses are becoming more repetitive you know at some point it's cheaper to uh, to retreat uh, as as radu alluded to but that's a very difficult decision politically socially for the individuals uh to make um i do know that the bond rating agencies are asking explicit questions of entities like wssc water they they actually had questions when they're doing their last bond rating from the the bond agencies so are you considering climate risk as part of your assessments you know five years ago those questions weren't being asked um the insurance industry is in the same situation. All you have to do is look at what just happened in Florida with Hurricane Ian. Um, was it uh, three of the local insurance companies have, have gone belly up in the last year? I think that's what I read. Um, 
it's it's a difficult situation and it's not equally spread across um you know everyone in a particular area that's why the risk assessments miranda alluded to is a key first step understand where your risks are and and try to mitigate and or retreat if if it comes to that again but that's a very politically sensitive topic so well, thanks so much, um, and thank you for your excellent answers to all of our guests' questions today and for your excellent presentations. Um, we just have a minute or so, and so I'll invite you for some some short final thoughts as we close today, and I'll, I'll go in reverse order of the presentations, and starting with Radu and ending with Lauren. Um, Radu? Well, uh, pretty much, I guess, what we wanted to convey today is how important uh, adaptation to climate challenges is on all levels. Um, even tapping a bit in what, what Lawrence said, um, the, the cost of inaction is simply unbearable. Uh, it, it, it's going to be ex expensive and difficult to adapt. Not adapting means the bankruptcy. That's, that's what it really means. Uh, when we can't sell bonds, we cannot fund government if we don't fund government we can't do government uh so it's uh i hope that in in our presentations and in our answers to to your questions we've conveyed some of these important truths and um take them to to your local um uh, people uh, discuss them there will be a lot of discussion to be had all across the nation about these about these issues and um, we are professionals at the end of the day we can present and uh, say what we know uh decisions are made by, the, by by all the people that are impacted by this and you know by all the people in, in, in some way thank you radu uh, miranda um, yeah, sure. I, um, I guess my point would be this sort of work is being done by a multitude of, of um, entities. We have, we Jacobs, we serve a lot of uh, municipal clients, municipal governments, utilities, um, and they're all uh, entities very used to um, dealing with, you know, massive asset systems that they're trying to plan for and renew continually and maintain level of service. So. They're very cognizant of these things, WSSC being a very forward thinking utility, always um, planning and putting systems in place. So um, developing the information is, is almost second nature to them to just at least get the get the arms around the issue and start planning for it. Um, so that's that's really good to see. And um, I, I think I think you know the drivers are, are different everywhere, but gaining gaining that knowledge and having that bookend on on risk is is really the important takeaway here, however you do that. Thanks, Miranda. And Lawrence, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Well, first, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, share our experience with everyone here today. Really appreciate it. Great questions. Um, I think the the main thoughts I was going to share, you know, have already been shared. The the one the one other point I would like to make is it's really important to uh, as you're launching yourself down this path of, of um, climate resilience assessments and, and planning and, and actual implementation, make sure that you look regionally and across sectors as, as, uh, as you think about this, because oftentimes a lot of the work may have been done by a sister agency. Uh, an example from Jacksonville, Florida, they, they did all this work similar to WSSC on the water wastewater side. The city of Jacksonville came shortly behind on, on the, the uh, f um, on the heels of that to do a stormwater master plan. And guess what? A lot of the flooding modeling, at least the riverine and coastal modeling had been done. So that provided a lot of efficiency. The electric authority um, all of a sudden realized that their, their risks could be uh, viewed um, through the same lens. Uh, again, a lot of the, the flood modeling had been done. So lots of benefits of just making sure you talk to your neighbors, talk to your sister agencies, because uh, doing it together uh, makes it more cost effective. And, and frankly, probably helps you with those difficult political decisions when you have to make those <laughs> tough choices, so. Thanks so much, Lawrence. And 
I just want to conclude our webinar preparing critical infrastructure for climate change, water utilities leading the way. I'd like to offer a very large thank you to Lawrence, Miranda, and Radu for a great presentation, and to Malcolm for his introduction, and to everyone who attended today and your great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And to John Coleman, our communications and technology expert, who helped to make all this happen. Um, the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on the Maryland Department of Planning's website. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need the certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Thanks again and have a great day.